Good day, and welcome to the Spartan Nash Company first quarter 2020 earnings call. All participants will be in listen-only mode. Should you need assistance, please signal a conference specialist by pressing the star key followed by zero. After today's presentation, there will be an opportunity to ask questions. Please note this event is being recorded. I would now like to turn the conference over to Katie Turner. Please go ahead. Good morning, and welcome to the Spartan Nash Company first quarter fiscal year 2020 earnings conference call. On the call today from the company are Dennis Edson, Chairman and Interim President and Chief Executive Officer, and Mark Schamber, Executive Vice President and Chief Financial Officer. By now, everyone should have access to the earnings release, which was issued yesterday at approximately 4.30 p.m. Eastern Time. For a copy of the earnings release, please visit Spartan Nash's website at www.spartannash.com backslash investors. This call is being recorded, and a replay will be available on the company's website for approximately 10 days. Before we begin, we'd like to remind everyone that comments made by management during today's call will contain forward-looking statements. These forward-looking statements discuss plans, expectations, estimates, and projections that may involve significant risks and uncertainties. Actual results may differ materially from the results discussed in these forward-looking statements. Internal and external factors that may cause such differences include, among others, disruption associated with the COVID-19 pandemic, competitive pressures amongst food, retail, and distribution companies, the uncertainties inherent in implementing strategic plans, and integrating operations and general economic and market conditions. Additional information about the risk factors and uncertainties associated with Spartan Nash's forward-looking statements can be found in the company's earnings release, most recent annual report on Form 10-K, and the company's other filings with the SEC. Because of these risks and uncertainties, investors should not place undue reliance on any forward-looking statements. Spartan Nash disclaims any intention or obligation to update or revise any forward-looking statements. This presentation includes certain non-GAAP measures and comparable period measures to provide investors with useful information about the company's financial performance. A reconciliation of these non-GAAP financial measures to the most directly comparable GAAP financial measure and other information as required by Regulation G is included in the company's earnings release, which was issued yesterday. And it's now my pleasure to turn the call over to Dennis. Thanks, Katie. Good morning, everyone, and we appreciate you joining us today to discuss our first quarter financial results. Before I get into our quarterly uh, quarterly results, I'd like to comment on the COVID-19 pandemic and the actions we're taking across our entire operations. Mark will then provide some additional detail on our first quarter financials and review our revised 2020 outlook. And finally, we'll open up the call and take some questions. First and foremost, our thoughts are with those affected by this virus. As the situation has continued to rapidly evolve, our first priority has been ensuring the well-being and safety of our team of associates, particularly those on the front lines driving our business forward every day, as well as our customers. Our leadership team quickly and effectively collaborated, and I'm proud to say we took decisive action and continue to execute. We implemented heightened safety measures in our retail stores and distribution centers to protect against the spread of COVID-19 amongst our associates, customers, and communities. The safety and sanitation efforts implemented during the pandemic include the installation of plastic shields at key points of customer interaction within retail stores, as well as within our DCs and the purchase of face masks and gloves for all frontline associates working at our retail stores and distribution centers, as well as the promotion of social distancing through signs and floor markings throughout our retail stores. Our team is also setting aside time twice per week for store guests who are at a higher risk of severe illness, including seniors, pregnant women, and those with compromised immune systems. We also increased fast lane staffing levels to accommodate the significant increase in the number of customers shopping online and are offering free same-day home delivery of prescription medications from our pharmacies. We proactively provided additional resources to help associates during this health crisis through an increase in their compensation. This includes weekly appreciation bonuses and an additional $2 per hour worked 
during times of significantly increased demand to more than 16,000 part and full-time frontline associates. We also doubled the existing associate discount in our company-owned retail stores to 20% off and extended emergency leave benefits to ensure associates who are sick are able to remain off work until they have fully recovered. As you would expect, we incurred both direct and indirect costs associated with these enhanced safety measures and support resources. Our ability to respond to the incremental consumer demand during the first quarter enabled us to significantly exceed our financial expectations. We are pleased to be in a position to raise our annual outlook, reflecting our strong first quarter execution in a challenging and uncertain environment as well as due to the realization of the benefits from many of our initiatives over the past year. These initiatives include strong organic sales growth within the food distribution segment prior to and separate from the lift from COVID-19, exiting our underperforming food processing businesses, improving working capital levels by over $140 million from the same period a year ago, taking action to right-size our organization through human resource initiatives, which were executed during the first quarter, and continued improvement in our supply chain operational execution. Our new guidance considers our results to date and expectations for our second quarter performance, which includes the anticipated impacts of the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic. Going forward, we remain committed to our long-term strategy as we build upon Spartan Nash's existing foundation and increasingly position the company to sustain profitable growth. Focusing on our first quarter financial results in a, a little more detail, for the quarter, consolidated net sales increased over 12% to $2.86 billion, representing the 16th consecutive quarter of growth for our company. This result exceeded our expectations as we benefited from higher sales across all segments from the COVID-19 related demand, as well as strong growth from existing customers in the food distribution segment. Retail comp store sales of 15.6% were positive for the third consecutive quarter, representing a significant acceleration from recent trends driven by the COVID-19 pandemic. As a reminder, our first quarter consisted of 16 weeks and in April 18th. Our company experienced the impacts of COVID-19 across all three of our segments beginning in the last six weeks of the quarter. There was a meaningful change in customer behavior in response to the pandemic as volumes increased due to retail consumers stocking up, followed by a shift to more food at home consumption in connection with uh, federal guidelines and state mandates and stay at home orders. Within the food distribution segment, sales comparisons to the prior year increased 9.5% for the first 10 weeks of the quarter as growth with existing customers accelerated. In the last six weeks of the quarter, we experienced a significant shift to food at home in connection with the state mandated business shutdowns, including restaurants, as well as stay at home orders. During this time, our sales trended higher than prior year by 29.7% and ended the quarter ahead of the prior year by 17.1%. Our supply chain worked tirelessly to support the surge in volume, partnering with our suppliers and other distributors to maximize our capacity and most efficiently deliver product to our stores. I'm proud of their hard work and innovation. Turning to the retail segment, through the first 10 weeks of the quarter, our comp store sales were on track to achieve our first quarter guidance of approximately flat and then accelerated to an increase of 42% for the last six weeks of the quarter, exceeding the quarter, ending the quarter at 15.6%. Our position in the marketplace as the local, convenient, and trusted grocer helped us to gain market share during the pandemic. In our largest market, our proactive approach allowed us to be first in market to install plexiglass sneeze guards, implement one-way aisles, launch free pharmacy delivery, and actually mandate masks 
for associates and customers. As consumer behavior continues to evolve in this uncertain environment, we believe our strong e-commerce platform, data insights, and understanding of consumer preferences, as well as the systems and infrastructure we have in place, will position us well to capitalize on these changes in our industry. Looking at the military segment, sales decreased 3.2% for the first 10 weeks of the quarter compared to the prior year. In the last six weeks of the quarter, sales trended higher than the prior year by 18.1%, ended the quarter ahead of the prior year by 4.9%. We recognize that in many remote military communities, we are the sole grocery distributor and our military heroes are relying on us. Our supply chain team is in constant contact with our CPG suppliers and holds daily telephonic meetings with our military customers to ensure that we're able to respond to the increased demand. We also continue to utilize innovative shipment solutions for troops stationed outside the continental United States, including airlifting product and revising naval shipping lanes into select European countries with U.S. military bases. We are also taking action in this time of great need to care for our communities through a number of charitable initiatives. Through the Spartan Ash Foundation, we recently made a grant to 19 Feeding America affiliated food banks. We've continued to support our local food bank charities through product donations and have also donated N95 masks to local hospitals. We are partnering with local restaurants to sell their food in our stores while they are unable to open, a, open their dining rooms. These actions support our core value of supporting the communities to which we belong, especially in these uncertain times. I'd also like to update you on a few of the other actions we've taken during the first quarter, which were unrelated to the COVID-19 pandemic and executed in the first 10 weeks of the quarter. First, we undertook human resource initiatives to promote long-term cost savings. These initiatives included a voluntary early retirement program for qualified associates, as well as a reduction in force to right-size our operations and focus our efforts in the areas of the most operational and, and administrative demands. Second, due to the loss of a major customer, we made the decision to exit the Kaido Fresh Cut business and began to wind down those operations in March and completed production by the end of the quarter. While this was a difficult decision, particularly in light of our many associates who've been affected, we did not see a path to prop profitable operations within this area of our business. We continue to value the legacy Kaido distribution operations as a key component of our fresh produce distribution efforts. We expect both of these actions to support our overall strategies to realize long-term profitable growth. And finally, I'd like to mention that the board of directors process to identify the next chief executive officer remains ongoing, and we made progress in the search over the, over the course of the last quarter. In summary, our first quarter operational and financial results demonstrate the strength and depth of our team. I'd like to thank our associates around the country for their collaboration which led to achieving these results. We are pleased to have exceeded our expectations for the quarter and remain committed to associate and customer safety, as well as supporting our supply chain to respond to incremental demand. I'll now turn the call over to Mark for the financial review. Thanks, Dennis, and I'd like to welcome everyone joining us on this morning's conference call. Uh, net sales for the first quarter of fiscal 2020 increased to $2.86 billion an increase of $314 million, or 12.4%, over 2019, 2019's first quarter sales of $2.54 billion. Adjusted EPS for the first quarter of fiscal 2020 came in at $0.67 cents per diluted share, compared to adjusted EPS of $0.24 cents per diluted share in fiscal 2019's first quarter, an increase of over 179%. While it is difficult to identify all the impacts of COVID-19 on, COVID on the quarter with a great deal of specificity, we have attempted to do so based on the trends we experienced prior to the dramatic surge in sales. 
As Dennis mentioned, that split falls roughly between the end of the 10th and the start of the 11th week of our first quarter, or more specifically, the week beginning Sunday, March 8th, 2020. Accordingly, as we reference specific metrics from a pre-COVID standpoint, that is where we're making the split for Spartan Nash's purposes. On a gap basis, the company had earnings of $0.43 cents per diluted share in the quarter, an increase of 105% over the $0.21 cents per share of earnings generated in the first quarter of fiscal 2019. Shifting to our business segments, net sales and food distribution increased by $200 million, or 17.1%, to $1.37 billion in the first quarter of fiscal 2020. Inflation accelerated to 2.05% in food distribution during the quarter, an increase of 66 basis points from Q4, and an increase of 123 basis points compared to the first quarter of fiscal 2019. Reported operating earnings for food distribution in the first quarter totaled $11.4 million. Improvements, largely driven by higher COVID sales volumes with existing customers, were more than offset by costs and asset impairments associated with the decision to exit our fresh cut business at Kaido, following the loss of a major customer, and the HR initiatives discussed previously. Adjusted operating income totaled $26.3 million in the quarter versus the prior year's first quarter adjusted operating income of $21.3 million. First quarter adjusted operating earnings in the current year exclude $14.9 million of expenses driven largely by the exit of our fresh cut business as detailed in Table 3 under the food distribution segment in yesterday's press release. Fiscal 2019's first quarter adjusted operating earnings excluded $3.2 million of income associated with a pre-tax gain and net of various expenses, which are also detailed in Table 3 of the press release. Military net sales of $704 million in the first quarter increased by $33 million, or 4.9%, compared to prior year revenues of $671 million. Incremental volume was driven by higher comparable sales at DECA locations in connection with COVID. Military distribution reported an operating loss of $2 million in the first quarter, compared to a loss of $1.6 million in the first quarter of fiscal 2019, primarily due to higher supply chain expenses and increased incentive compensation, partially offset by improved margin rates. On an adjusted basis, military's operating loss was $1.4 million for the first quarter of fiscal 2020, compared to a loss of $0.8 million in 2019's first quarter, due to the same reason. Finally, our retail net sales came in at $783 million for the quarter compared to $702 million in the first quarter last year, an increase of 11.5% or $81 million. Our comparable store sales improved to 15.6% for the first quarter of fiscal 2020 compared to comp sales of half a percent for the fourth quarter of fiscal 2019. Comparable store sales benefited from the impact of state shutdowns associated with COVID-19 during the last six weeks of the fiscal quarter coming in at 42%, as Dennis mentioned. These results reflect increases of over 300% in our e-commerce sales in the last six weeks of the quarter, and e-commerce sales have increased by over 400% for the same period in the prior year through the first five weeks of Q2. Similarly, our private brand product sales increased by over 60% in Q1 over the last six weeks of the quarter, and are up approximately 39% through the first five weeks of Q2 over the same period in fiscal 2019. First quarter adjusted operating earnings in retail came in at $15.3 million compared to $2.7 million in 2019's first quarter. Retail reported gap income of $12.6 million for the first quarter of 2020 compared to a loss of $0.8 million in the prior year's first quarter. The increase was driven primarily by the COVID-related sales during the quarter, while we also benefited from lower than expected healthcare expenses partially offset by higher DIR fees paid to pharmacy benefit managers and significantly higher incentive compensation driven by the strong comparable sales and increased profitability. While not as apparent due to our comparable sales growth, we continue to see pressure from the increase in DIR fees in the pharmacy as pharmacy margins were $2.4 million lower than the first quarter of 2019 and below our expectations. As we progress through the remainder of fiscal 2020, we once again expect pharmacy DIR fees to represent a headwind as the PBMs continue to increase their fees on both a rate and dollar basis. Interest expense decreased $4.2 million in the first quarter of fiscal 2020 to $7.6 million due to lower average debt levels associated with reductions in working capital and lower interest rates compared to the same period last year, 
with more than 80% of the year-over-year -year reduction having no connection to the steps taken by the Federal Reserve during the first <coughs> quarter of fiscal 2020. In the first quarter of 2020, we generated consolidated operating cash flows of $129.3 million compared to $13.5 million during the prior year period, an increase of over $115 million. The year-over-year -year improvement was driven by a combination of the company's efforts to reduce working capital and improve return on capital, the unplanned reductions in working capital associated with the COVID surge, and the shift in timing of the Easter holiday shifting a week earlier in the quarter with a corresponding impact on increased collections of accounts receivable before quarter end. Additionally, we generated positive free cash of $111 million in the first quarter of fiscal 2020 versus generating negative free cash of $2 million in the prior year's first quarter. During 2020's first quarter, we declared and returned $7 million in the form of cash dividends. We also repurchased shares at an average price of $11.62 for a total of $10 million in the quarter. Our total net long-term debt increased by $88.4 million to end the quarter at $576 million compared to $664.4 million at the end of fiscal 2019, as we paid down over $91 million of debt during the quarter. Our net long-term debt to adjusted EBITDA ratio decreased to 2.9 to 1 in the first quarter from 3.7 to 1 at the end of fiscal 2019, driven by the combination of our strong debt pay down during the quarter, as well as more than a 35% increase in adjusted EBITDA to $74 million. We expect to continue to make progress on our leverage and that we will, that we will be, as by the end of the fiscal year, closer to our target of two and a half times before the impact of seasonal variances. As covered in our press release last evening, we are revising our fiscal 2020 earnings guidance while we are withdrawing our initial sales guidance issued on February 19, 2020 due to the uncertainty associated with estimating sales, although we expect to materially exceed that initial sales guidance. For fiscal year 2020, we now anticipate adjusted earnings per share from continuing operations of approximately $1.85 to $2 compared to our prior projection of $1.12 to $1.20. Reported earnings per share from continuing operations are expected to range from $1.48 to $1.81, compared to our prior projection of $0.93 cents to $1.04. For the second quarter of fiscal 2020, adjusted earnings per share are expected to increase 70 to 100% over fiscal 2019 second quarter adjusted earnings per share of $0.33. Cents. The company's updated outlook for the second half of the year does not include any adjustment for future impacts from the COVID-19 pandemic. However, we currently estimate that any incremental costs related to COVID-19 will be more than offset by the improved food-at-home sales trend. We now expect fiscal 2020 adjusted EBITDA to be in the range of $205 to $215 million, compared to our prior guidance of $180 to $190 million consistent with our projected increases in operating earnings. Our guidance continues to reflect capital and, IT, uh, capital and IT capital expenditures in the range of 80 to $90 million for fiscal year 2020. Depreciation and amortization are now expected to be $88 million to $92 million for the fiscal year. Interest expense is now expected to range from $19.5 million to $21 million in fiscal 2020 and the company's guidance reflects an adjusted effective tax rate of 23 to 24.5% and a reported effective tax rate of 14 to 18%. And at this point, I'd like to turn the call back over to Dennis. Thanks, Mark. Just in closing, we're pleased with our start of the year and we'll continue to focus on our execution to respond to challenges from the COVID-19 pandemic with our priority continuing to be the well-being and safety of our associates and customers. We remain confident in the strength of our platform as we look to achieve these objectives. And with that, I'd like to turn the call back over to Sarah and open it up for any questions. Thank you. We will now begin the question and answer session. To ask a question, you may press star then one on your touchtone phone. If you're using a speakerphone, please pick up your handset before pressing the keys. To withdraw your question, please press star then two. At this time, we will pause momentarily to assemble our roster. Our first question will come from Karen Short with Barclays. Please go ahead. Hi, good morning. This is Kate Howard on for Karen. 
Thanks for taking our Dave. questions. Morning. Morning um, so first, first, I was hoping you could help us parse through the margin flow through puts and takes at retail and help us think about how much is related to pure leverage on sales, um, any gas margin benefit, any shrink benefit, reduced promotional cadence, um, and so forth. And then any directional commentary would be helpful. And related to that, how to think about modeling out the second quarter and what aspects are sticky versus not. Yeah, that's, that's a lot to unpack in, in that question, Kate. I, I mean, I guess, you know, I'll, I'll share some information. I think some of the items that you're um, specifically asking about, we don't typically provide, and, and you know, and so I'm not sure even in, in this circumstance that we would get to that level of detail. Um, but, you know, maybe breaking it down from, you know, top of the P&L to the bottom and, and letting it kind of flow through, um, look, you know, I, I think as we look at the top line, even though we didn't give sales guidance, you know, through the first five weeks of the quarter, you know, we were running in the low 20s from a retail comp. I think we we're just under 23% through the first five weeks. And so, you know, I think directionally that should give you an idea of where things currently are and, you know, again, trying to predict where they'll be and how that trend will, will move is difficult, but that's where they are through the first five weeks. You know, on the margin side, you know, again, we don't generally get into a lot of the different details that you asked, and so I'm not going to try to break those out now. However, I, I would say that in the first quarter, you know, our estimates across the organization, again, not by business unit, but our estimates across the organization are that we probably had six to eight million dollars associated with COVID costs, um, and would over the you know over the six weeks at the end of the first quarter and would expect a similar number for the entire second quarter. So, you know, roughly the same number over twice the number of weeks as we had in the first period. Um, and so I think on the flow through, you know, it's, I think that it's the ratio that we've had for retail in the first quarter is a reasonable rate to continue to use, um, barring, you know, anything, ch any changes in sort of kind of in, um, in, in the rates and sort of how the breakdown is of what we're selling. But I would say that in general, that's a relatively good margin to use going forward. And I think there was probably another couple of things you would ask beyond that, but I think that answers most of your question for retail. Yeah, that's, that's, that's very helpful for retail. Um, I guess my second question is just on uh, SNAP benefits. So we know that there's incremental dollars out there and can you give us any color of what you saw maybe in the first quarter or what you're seeing thus far in 2Q and if there's, you know, any impact to Spartan? Yeah, Kate, the, uh, the EBT, EBT sales have dramatically changed for us going uh, the first 10 weeks of the quarter. Our, our EBT sales were actually running negative, um, uh, about 16% actually, and no surprise, the economy here has been very, very robust. So, you know, less food stamps, we're getting less. Um, if you look at the post, uh, the last six weeks of the quarter, food stamps were up 45%. Remember that? We ended April 18th. Um, but if you look at the more current Q2 five weeks, our food stamps have gone up 113%. So we've seen a significant increase in food stamp redemption um, into this early part of the second quarter. Our next question will come from Christopher Mandeville with Jeffries. Please go ahead. Hey, good morning, guys. Um, Dennis, I guess I was curious if you could speak to just some of those signs of distribution strength that you were realizing pre-COVID. Any additional color you can offer there with respect to where those gains are coming from and Maybe do you have any visibility on the pipeline going forward or, for that matter, is the demand that you're realizing from existing accounts today potentially uh, too much from a capacity standpoint to onboard your business? Yeah, uh, multiple questions there. Uh, we guided the last quarter that we thought food distribution would be mid-single digits positive. Um, and so we exceeded that a bit and, uh, at 9.5% uh, for the first 10 weeks. We had a strong start to the year. You know, it is primarily through uh, existing distribution customers. Obviously, 
there's always some puts and takes, and we, we did onboard some new business. Um, I, I would say to you that when you, when you add on the kind of volume we did to the supply chain, the you know, nearly 30% lift in those last six weeks, um, it, it, it has been and continues to be a challenge uh, for us to get the efficiencies out of the out of the system, so sometimes it's, it can be too much of a good thing. But our supply chain team has just done a remarkable job. Uh, we're really stressed there a lot by the vendor community's inability to keep up, and you know we're getting trucks that are half full instead of full because of allocation of product. But um, we think this is something we can work through, and you know we're. We think there's a big tailwind here as well. And do you think on the supply chain front, at least from the, the vendor's perspective, uh, we've been hearing anecdotal evidence of, of how they're kind of streamlining their own processes, really focusing in on select high-velocity SKUs uh, to the detriment of some tail-end SKUs, if you will. Did, did you see that play through out your distribution, and how do you envision that moving forward? Yeah, we absolutely see that. We've actually got north of 2,000 SKUs that are either on a strict allocation and or they've just ceased producing in order to be more efficient <clears throat> in their systems. So we're feeling that. Um, and I think going forward, like so much of what's happened here with the pandemic, the change in behavior. I suspect we're going to have manufacturers reducing unproductive SKUs for, from their portfolio. That's just a dentist guess. Uh, it's not like we've seen you know, the material on that, but I think it's a logical uh, kind of extension of what's going on so far. Got it. Okay. And then uh, the final one for me before I just top myself back into the queue is, um, so, Mark, now that you guys are down just a point nine times levered and expect to be around two and a half by year end, uh, I suppose I can do some math on what that requires to get there. But in terms of any additional free cash flow that you'll generate throughout the remainder of the year, how should we be thinking about that being put to use between the likes of M&A, dividend, and, and buyback? And just to kind of add one other wrinkle to the question, I mean, how does the M&A market look today? Let me just say, on the, on the, the leverage, you know, the 3.7 to 2.9, we're delighted with that. You know, I think Mark's comments, he said, thinks we'll get closer to the 2.5 times that we've historically talked about being our sweet spot. Um, so uh, we think we're going to continue to make progress. Obviously, when you're levered up, you know, 3.7 times, you think about M&A a little bit differently. Uh, from your balance sheet, you know, I would say as it relates to, you know, M&A, we've been pretty consistently discussing our being opportunistic around the retail side for M&A. But Martin's was a great example, an existing customer, adjacent marketplace, a good sense. I, I think we do retail like that. Um, and then on the distribution side, you know, I think, you know, Obviously, always looking for the right opportunity to, to add scale and, you know, to expand our network to allow us to be even more efficient as we continue to grow the business. You know, kind of lost in all of this, the fact that I mentioned it in my remarks, but, you know, at 16 consecutive quarters, we've grown the top line. And, you know, that's a – we celebrate that here, and, I, and you know, I think uh, it, it's, a, uh, it's a good kind of omen for things to come. Got it. And I apologize, I'm going to sneak one more in there. Um, on the retail front, was there any real divergence in terms of performance regionally between the likes of, you know, call it Core Michigan versus the Dakotas versus Nebraska, and and how did that play out in terms of market share gains? Yeah, that, that, that's a good question. You know, we we got it all over. Um, and I would say to you, you know, and I've, I've been hanging around this space really my whole life, I've never seen – the kind of market share gains that we picked up in in my career, they were very meaningful. Um, I, I will, and these are AC Nielsen numbers, um, and I would tell you they were slightly better in Michigan than they were 
in Indiana and Nebraska, but they were all very significant. Perfect. I'll leave it there. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Chris. Our next question comes from Kelly Bania with BMO Capital. Please go ahead. Hi, good morning. Uh, thanks for taking my questions, and congrats on a great quarter here. Um, wondering if you could talk about just inflation. We, um, you know, obviously saw the data for the industry in April, which really accelerated. Wondering if you could just help us, uh, you know, understand what you're seeing at wholesale, at retail, and how that's trending into May, and just the impact of, you know, maybe vendors pulling back on promotions and, and mix and, and all the factors driving kind of price and mix uh, across the board here. Yeah, so maybe I'll maybe I'll tackle the inflation part, and I'll let Dennis and I together tackle the uh, promotion side of it. I mean, I, I would say on the inflation front, you know, we, we referenced the numbers for the quarter. Um, and so, you know, when we look at where we've gone, you know, as of late, on the retail side, you know, we finished the quarter and we were at about 1.76, so up 43 basis points from the fourth quarter, you know, compared to the prior year was more than double, right? When last year's first quarter – well, it was almost 10 times, right? Last year's first quarter was 18 bips and 176 bips. You're up, you know, 156 bips, 158 bips. Um, in period five, we saw retail take a little bit of a decline in the in the um, inflation. It went to about 1.62. And, you know, it was, was a little bit here and there. There wasn't anything from a broad category standpoint. Although, as I now talk about food distribution, I would say that the inflation rate in meat doubled in retail from the first quarter to period five. The, the challenge is that when we look at meat from a food distribution standpoint, um, you know, it nearly tripled from the first quarter. So the first quarter we were running probably about a little bit north of six and a quarter for meat. And for the fifth period, due to a lot of the plant closures and some of the shortages, you know, we saw inflation of almost 17% within the meat category. And so for distribution, you know, we we saw a significant uptick where we were just under 5% for inflation. Um, we think that the meat inflation that we're seeing will ease off and come back over the next few periods. Um, but certainly for period five, you know, there was, there was that additional pressure. And obviously, you know, that's eating into the margins a little bit on the retail side. Yeah, and we have seen and I guess, you know, we're going to digest that meat margin impact at retail. We've been eating that yep. early in the second quarter, 17%. We can't get that at the shelf. We had a little bit of a similar prob problem in, in Q2 with dairy. Dairy was, you know, the most inflationary category in, in Q2 at wholesale. Heck, we eggs went from $0.75 cents to $3 a dozen. You just can't keep up. So we had some contraction and our dairy margins in Q1, and, and that just happens. Um, but we're seeing a little less promotional activity, and, and, and that's having Im impact, you know, throughout our system, through the distribution segment as well as the retail segment. I think the, the team has done a great job managing through that and how it impacts our P&L. You know, we've been, we've continued to stay promotional. Not all of our competitors and our largest competitor here in Michigan happened to pull their print ad, we stayed with a print ad and have continued um, through the whole pandemic. And although we've scaled it back a few pages, we think being promotional is important. And I think that may be a, another reason that we gained some share, uh, along with being first to market on some of those things that I think consumers were, you know, were happy to see that we were proactive. Um, so a lot of moving parts to, to the promotional piece, though, Kelly. <clears throat> okay, thank you. And um, you, you talked about quarter-to-date, I think, around 23% at, at retail. Um, can you talk about, you know, distribution, and is that you know, following a similar pattern or just um, maybe help us think about where that where that's trending? Yeah, so through the first five weeks of, of Q2, we're just under 23% positive comps at retail. Again, it's being driven by the basket size. It continues to be, you know, over 45% positive. Um, 
And, um, and although we were 30% 29.7 in distribution, um, we're still running very strong in distribution, not quite 29.7, um, but um, uh, pretty close to it. We're north of the number that we reported just now on, on the retail in Q2. So continues to be strong there as well. And I would just highlight that that's the food distribution side. The military side um, has, has eased off to a greater extent, and a lot of that's driven by access to the bases, and individual uh, base commanders have the authority to limit access to the commissaries which are on the bases. And so that's, we think that you know that is a contributing factor as well as some of the longer distances that folks have to travel um, from a shelter-in-place standpoint that's impacted on the military side. So the military is trended below those numbers. Okay, that's helpful. Um, and Mark, I think you mentioned, I think you said six to eight million in incremental COVID costs on the retail side. Um, no, that was, expect- oh, sorry, that was the whole, oh. that was the whole company. We, we didn't whole company. break out the, we didn't break out the individual business units. Okay. But I guess a, expecting a similar dollar amount for Q2, but across, you know, the full quarter. So maybe can you just think about, you know, the puts and takes there and when we should expect kind of the incremental pay and appreciation bonus and et cetera to kind of tail off and, and is how, um, you know, affects the second quarter kind of cost outlook. Yeah, Kelly, I mean, and, and that's part of the reason we kind of gave a range because we're, we're not really sure as to when some of those different things will drop off. I mean, we've, we've changed our programs a, a number of times since COVID's kind of kicked in, and we continue to, um, I guess, change from a weekly standpoint some of the different uh, incentives and, and frontline pay that we provide to the associates. And so it's, it's a little bit tough to say when it's going to discontinue or – how it's going to play out over the remainder of the weeks. Um, but one thing that I would share that, um, you know, we have been doing is that as an example, you know, some of the some of the costs that we're incurring right now that we've utilized outside services, we plan to bring in house from a sanitization standpoint and have purchased the equipment or have the per- equipment on order. And so we think as we get later into the year that, you know, we'll be bringing some of those costs down significantly because the – the procurement of the equipment and doing it on a weekly basis internally, you know, maybe 75 to 80 percent less than paying a third party to do it right now. <clears throat> okay, that's that's helpful. And I guess just you know, bigger picture, longer term question as we think about you know exiting the fresh cut uh, business and you know years ago when that was started, that was you know, a faster growing category that was going to help kind of get some new customers. And, uh, you know, where do you, where do you th- think um, Spartan can be longer term with respect to those categories? Is that, you, you know, are, we, are you going to be out of those kind of fresh cut categories longer term? Is there an opportunity to do that in a different way or just maybe strategically how you're thinking about, about that, uh, that segment of the business? Yeah, that's a good question, and I think the um, the fresh cut uh, opportunity still exists. We're, I think there are a couple ways to potentially harness it. Um, one is in some of our stores, we're actually <clears throat> we've got a program we call Fresh Divide, where we're we actually have a, a process to do it in store in a really quite robust way, where a consumer can you know bring up you know, the fruit she wants diced or the vegetables and we'll do it custom. That's one approach. Um, I think the, uh, the second approach uh, could be where there they may be smaller facilities attached to a distribution center that could potentially uh, service a tighter geography. It's uh, the difficulty of shipping that processed product uh, over long distances with limited shelf life um, certainly is is a challenge. So we're we're going to study that a, a bit more as we as we look into the future. Thank you. Our next question comes from Chuck Sarankowski with North Coast Research. Please go ahead. Good morning, everyone. Uh, in, 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 
in looking at the strong business trends so far to date, can you talk about uh, what it means for capital spending? Uh, not so much for this year, but I, but but to the degree it does, let, discuss it. But I'm thinking about next year, Dennis and Mark. I mean, what kind of uh, wear and tear are you seeing on the truck fleet? Where do you need to add capacity for things you think are uh, sustainable gains in market share? to the extent that you might have to build additional warehouse capacity, et cetera. Yeah, you know, Chuck, I, I think from our standpoint, as it relates to rolling stock and, and handling equipment, I mean, we've got rotational programs in place on the rolling stock that, you know, we, you know, we rotate the fleet every number, I think it's five years, six years, somewhere depending on, you know, the tractors and the trailers obviously have a slightly longer life. Um, so I, I don't think that that really changes anything there. If anything, during some of the surge aspects, you know, we may have leased from a month-to-month -month standpoint some additional equipment, and then, you know, to the extent it becomes permanent, we'll go out and procure, um, you know, that additional capital accordingly from, from that standpoint so that, you know, we, when we know what is the ongoing rate, we'll, we'll adjust from that perspective. And, and if anything, it maybe accelerates, you know, part of the refresh that we were doing on some of the MAG. How about uh, warehouse capacity? Well, I think on the warehouse capacity, you know, it's something we have to continue to look at. You know, part of part of the success that we've had over the last year and, and really leading up to the surge in reducing, you know, the amount of inventory that we had in the DCs and the improvement in working capital gives you additional capacity, you know, within those DCs, whether it's to carry more reserve stock and or um, you know, bring in additional SKUs if you, if you, you know, exit from an underperforming SKU perspective. But, you know, it's something certainly if the rates continue that we'll have to put into focus so that we ensure that we can continue with, you know, these elevated levels. The question is, if you ask me where we'll be at the end of the year, I don't think I could answer that. And so, you know, there's a balance of being ready to build for the future, um, but, you know, not building so much that you're not going to use it for the next five years. Got it. Thanks very much. Good luck as you uh, deal with this uh, uncertain but strong sales outlook. Thanks, Chuck. Our next question comes from Scott Mushkin with R5 Capital. Please go ahead. Hey, guys. Uh, thanks for taking my questions. So these are really more kind of industry structural questions. Um, so and they're kind of a little bit tied together. So Omnichannel, I don't, maybe I missed it, but I don't know if you guys gave any, any, uh, numbers around that. So I'd love to understand that. And then I also wanted to get your thoughts on, you know, we have some good survey data in our consumer surveys that show Omnichannel is really coming of age. And I wanted to see what you guys think, you know, where we settle out Omnichannel over the next couple of years. And then the other structural question is, you know, the small and medium sized grocers seem to have really benefited here. Do you think that is something that could continue or, you know, how are you thinking about, you know, those customers of your distribution and how they can handle you know, kind of the new environment, uh, needs to be omnichannel, but just the kind of a whole new world. Thanks. Yeah. Let me take a, a whack at that and Mark can embellish uh, as he sees fit. So, uh, you know, our e-commerce numbers were really very, very encouraging. So if you go back pre COVID, that, the, the 10 weeks uh, to start the year, it, well, let me back up a bit. We, got, we have 84 of our 155 locations that have a, an e-commerce solution. Um, I don't know the exact number, but it, it's, it's you know, probably 70% of the volume. I'm not sure exactly that number, but it's the bigger stores. You know, some of these smaller rural towns, one-store towns, we don't have the uh, – the uh, option there, but we were doing 2.2% of the volume in those stores in our e-commerce platform. And uh, then when we got to the six weeks of COVID where it hit, that went up to 5% of the volume in those stores. And through the first five weeks of Q2, we're just short of 7% of the volume being done on our e-commerce platform. And, um, you know, we, <clears throat> we do a survey, we call it OSAT, overall satisfaction, on a score of one to five, five being the best. Um, we had a 76% uh, 
uh, score of customers giving us a five on that platform, despite the fact that you know, our, our service level in terms of out of stocks was appreciably from the historic levels. Um, historically, we've performed on that OSAT metric in the mid 80s. And I think the team did a spectacular job of working this. We kept our wait times down in terms of once the consumer got there. Certainly, we were in a position where you know, we were days out in some instances and in some locations to get an appointment uh, for click and collect. About 20% of the volume is delivered. About 80% is uh, click and collect curbside. Um, we also talked to our customers that participated and asked them uh, how frequently they thought they may use the service or will they stop using the service. Um, and 76% of our customers said after the pandemic they're going to continue to use e-commerce consistent to the point you just made. I think IRI did a similar survey and their number was 84%, so we're feeling pretty good about that. So I think that's a very strong tailwind for us. Um, and, you know, we're going to continue to work through that. We do have uh, loyalty data, card data, so we know the new customers who played and, uh, you know, we're obviously uh, reaching out to them as is appropriate. But I think that's a strong tailwind for us. Um, and, and then I think you're right. Um, the smaller uh, footprint stores seem to have benefited. You know, I don't I, – I commented that in my, in my remarks earlier, you know, were that – convenient, local, you know, I'm, you know, it feels like we got so many positive comments from customers, so I'm going to throw in trusted, you know, neighborhood store, right, part of your community. You know, we took care of our associates early. <clears throat> we were first to do a lot of those things, and I think that all resonated. So I, I do think um, there's a tailwind there as well, and I also think that that impacts our distribution customer base the same way it affects our stores. So I think you're right. <clears throat> I think there were some other things that really helped us as well. You know, our private brand penetration, I think Mark brought up, we were up 60% on our private brand that six weeks after COVID. We're, we're still running just a little short of 40% up on private brand. Um, that's, I think, another tailwind that we have. So I think lots of good things potentially come out of a very serious and difficult situation that we're all dealing with. So then my, my follow-up question, and thanks for that, um, is around, you know, you talked about snapping up, what was it, 113% in the five weeks. You talked about huge private label uptake. I mean, generally that suggests a consumer that is, would be very cautious around, and a consumer that is likely to get more and more interested in price. Um, so any thoughts you have there on just the, the current environment? You know, obviously, unemployment rate's really high. I, I think in Michigan, it's you know, very high. So, you know, what, what's going on with the consumer, their behavior? Um, a lot of cross currents in all of retail, but it seems those numbers would make you a little bit cautious. Yeah, so I, I think that's a, that's a great question. And, you know, I think part of the what you're seeing with the, the food stamp redemption is um, – you know, there were more food stamps distributed. So we're, we should get a lift. Did we get an outsized lift? It appears to me, I don't have anything quantifiable here. It appears to me that we did. Um, the, the food stamp numbers as we get government data comes out a little delayed. Um, it appears that we did, but we got an outsized lift, outsized lift everywhere as I talked about the market share. So, um, you know, is it consumers taking less longer trips to go to maybe a super center, potentially it is that. Um, it, you know, how much of that is a actually increased spending versus a shift in spending from, the, you know, the currency change from a debit, debit card to, to food stamps? I don't know. You know, the, the private brand, I think you're right, is a bit of a harbinger. I mean, I would, uh, as we look at those numbers and they were rolling off at 60%, you know, they were, you know, stunning part of that, you know, as, as, as product from 
national CPGs was running short or being allocated or was unavailable and we had a private label alternative, you know, we benefited from that consumer trial on private brand. The good news is, as we surveyed our customers about that private brand, when they made that switch and they tried it, it's like 90% of the customers said that they gave our private brand either a good or an excellent rating and the intention to repurchase was strong. So yes, it may be talking about a little bit of stress in the consumer. It maybe is about availability, but still I think it's a, it's a positive for us going forward. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Thanks, Scott. Our next question is a follow-up from Christopher Mandeville with Jeffries. Please go ahead. Hey, guys. Um, I just wanted to follow up really quickly on the fuel profit contribution to the quarter. Um, obviously, we realized pretty record fuel margins to help offset some material volume declines. So, Mark, if there's any ability to speak to that and then – uh, maybe help us understand how, how volumes might have recovered quarter to date? Yeah, I mean, I would say that, you know, for the entire quarter, you know, we were probably down low double digits in gallons, probably, you know, 11%, 12% for the quarter. Um, you know, dollar-wise, it was probably a little bit north of 20 just because the price per gallon was down a, a fair amount. So, you know, blended, it probably works out to a little bit north of 10%. Um, you know, for, for us, you know, we, we benefited a little bit on the margin overall for the quarter. Uh, the margins were leading up to kind of the COVID surge. The margins were actually a little bit um, below seasonal norms. And so while we, we benefited from larger margins in the last six weeks, um, it really only brought us back to, you know, almost the, almost the level that we would have been, um, you know, from, from our plan perspective. You know, and as we look at you know, as we look at where we are, I mean, I, I think that we're seeing that the gallons are, you know, starting to increase. I mean, they're still below um, sort of what our projections were in versus the prior year, but the differential, um, you know, where we were seeing, you know, some weeks during the COVID surge down 40, 50 percent, you know, we're probably now back down to closer to the 20 percent range. Okay, that's helpful. And then just sorry, I might have missed this, but did you reference the breakdown or split between traffic and ticket for retail in the quarter? Um, we we did we didn't, but the the ticket for the quarter was up. Uh, oh, it was almost fifty percent. It was forty nine percent for the queue. Uh, I'm sorry, it was forty nine percent for the six weeks of COVID, um, and for the full quarter, it was up seventeen percent. Got it. Okay. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Chris. This concludes our question and answer session. I would like to turn the conference back over to Dennis Edson for any closing remarks. Thanks, Sarah. And I want to thank everybody for their participation on today's call. We look forward to speaking with you again when we report our uh, second quarter 2020 results. Everybody have a great day and stay safe. The conference is now concluded. Thank you for attending today's presentation. You may now disconnect.